Hi everyone, my name is Sebastian. Um, I've been a Drupal developer for six years um, and I now work for Amazing Labs. Um, today we're going to talk about GraphQL and GraphQL together with Drupal. Um, it's been quite an interesting journey over the past year. So uh, at my previous employer, we have started uh, looking uh, at a very, very complex project and pitching for that very complex project. And we were looking for solutions for solving our problem with um, the client side part of the application and fetching very complex data graphs. Um, we found that REST was not the perfect solution for this case because we had very sophisticated data requirements in the front end, which would have meant a huge number of uh, round trips and uh, uh, load on the server. So we were looking for a different solution. And coincidentally, at the same time, Facebook published uh, a new open source project called GraphQL, which we are going to talk about today. So what is inside of this presentation? First of all, we're going to talk about the motivations behind GraphQL, also known as the limitations of REST. And we're going to talk or look at some GraphQL real-life examples. We're going to see some um, demo queries uh, running on both Drupal and the demo API. Um, and we are going to look at the status quo of the module and the future outlook of the module and possible features that are coming in the very soon future. So the motivation behind GraphQL. When you see or when you look at the new technology, it's always very healthy to question the benefits of that new technology. It's very healthy to um, question yourself, does it actually add any value? Is there anything in there that is going to A, make the technology last for a longer time because you want to maintain your application? And uh, it, has to, like, it has to make a benefit for you. And um, the motivations of GraphQL are clearly that now with the modern web and all of the complex data requirements that large modern front-end applications have, like Facebook, for example, itself, or Netflix, um, uh, they require um, very, very um, fundamentally hierarchical data, and they require a lot of that data. So REST has some fundamental flaws when it comes to solving these problems. And you've probably seen this list before. Um, I'm just going to repeat it anyways. So we have the problem of overfetching, underfetching, the problem of the additional round trips, um, especially that because we don't have HTTP2 yet widely available, and we have the problem of versioning. Um, let's see what those actually mean in detail. So imagine you are building a front-end application because you are very much into Star Wars and you want to provide a nice user interface for people who want to learn about Star Wars trivia. Um, you might want to display some, some cards of information for learn, learning, these informa learning these things for a pub quiz, for example. And so first of all, you want to fetch a list of people involved in some of the movies. Um, characters from those movies. So we want to display the name of the character, we want to display the movie appearances, and we might want to display a list of home, uh, the home planets um, of that person. So you go ahead and uh, make an API call on the REST API, and as you see, we are, retrieve, we are receiving a wide range of information, wide range of data, um, much of which we don't need. So that's called overfetching. Um, we were only interested in a few uh, fields on that request, and we are getting all of this information back. And that's what it looks like. So we have the server pu puking data all over us. And um, because the data is hierarchical, and if we look back at the first slide, you see uh, we don't get the information that we wanted, the names of the films. We don't get the names of the planets. Instead, we get references to additional re resources, which we then have to fetch uh, separately. So we do another round trip to the planet that the user is uh, linked to and get this information. And that's producing additional round trips to the server. So first we fetch the first set of data, we get that information, we have to resolve it, and then we make additional requests on the server and get the information like drop by drop, piece by piece, back into our client side application. Um, and that kind of illustrates the way we are currently thinking as backend developers um, about our data. We, we have our SQL databases, and we are kind of moving the same ideology into the front end. We're kind of moving the same ideology into our APIs by providing SQL-like join table resources where we fetch um, a simple data structure one dim in a one-dimensional fashion to then retrieve the other related information piece by piece. What's happening now? Oh, okay. 
And it gets even worse if we want to fetch the information about the, the films that the person was involved with. So it really quickly gets out of hand. And imagine you're now building this front set application, and imagine what it feels like for the user, right? So the, 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 the user comes onto your website, and then the, the data pops up huh? one piece at, at, at each time. And that's a very horrible user experience as well. So you might think now, well, I can easily fix that with REST. I can easily fix that by providing um, a way of querying my API like this. Um, so you come up with a like, custom um, solution to your problem where you say, OK, I provide a query parameter, a get parameter, where people can specify um, what fields they want from related resources. Or you might come up with custom resources altogether that speci specifically for your specific use case return a custom set of data. Or you might come up with something like this. And um, if you have worked with complex front-end applications, probably also with multiple different versions of those and, might for, and supporting multiple different devices, you might think the guy is crazy. Um, because what is the problem with this is it gets out of hand very quickly. Um, imagine you have to support a web, uh, web application, um, an Android application, and an uh, iPhone and an iOS application, and you have to support multiple different versions of those across um, during the lifetime of your application. It really quickly gets, um, or uh, exponentially increases the complexity of your application. So you end up with these hundreds of resources potentially, and um, at some point, your application becomes unmaintainable. And or may, maybe you don't even know which resources are still used. So you end up with dead resources that no one is using, but they are still there. So wouldn't it be great if instead we could simply call an API and only retrieve um, the information that we really need through a single resource without having to do additional round trips? So let me switch to the demo. This is now the time for the, for the first demo. So imagine you want to fetch the information that we just saw. Um, you want to fetch a list of people, and you want to fetch, for each of these people, you want to fetch their name, maybe their hair color, the homeworld, and only the name of the homeworld, and you want to fetch all of the films that the person appeared in, and only the titles of those as well. And it magically just resolves that request and fills in all, the, all of the information for us. And what you're looking here right now, you might have guessed that, is GraphQL. And the interface that you see here is called GraphQL. It's a visual um, in-browser IDE, basically, for crafting GraphQL queries with type aheads and uh, suggestions. Um, so that's quite, quite cool, right? Uh, let me go back to my slides. So that's quite, quite cool. Um, we now have a way for retrieving data without having additional round trips, without the potential for overfetching, um, without the potential for underfetching. And um, especially in Drupal, that's quite relevant, because what do we have with Drupal? We saw a, a demo of, of BigPipe before, right? And didn't you find it scary that there was um, that also Jam before in the keynote and in the, in the opening session said, well, Drupal actually is quite slow. And he's, he's right, Drupal is slow, and that's because of the hefty bootstrap that we have. PHP is not the fastest, PHP 7 is becoming faster, but still Drupal, the Drupal bootstrap itself is really, really heavy on, uh, on our servers. And um, if you multiply that by the amount of times you have to hit the server with REST, it gets even worse. Um, so especially for Drupal, GraphQL is very, very intriguing. Um, so what is GraphQL actually? GraphQL is a data querying language. Um, it runs on arbitrary code, meaning that it is completely agnostic of your storage layer. It simply executes functions on the server side um, that can use your existing APIs to um, uh, fulfill the request. Uh, it is based on a type schema, so it is, it is uh, strictly typed. And uh, you can provide your schema as a series, as a graph of type definitions. And it's fully introspective. And what that actually means is something that we will look at on the next demo. Um, but yeah, what's also important to mention is GraphQL is not a query language on a graph database. 
Um, the name might be quite misleading, but that's really important to point out because GraphQL is completely agnostic of the storage layer, as I just said. Um, what it does is, it, um, or what it actually means, GraphQL is basically just a specification, a language specification that um, says, okay, we have the syntax, and the syntax is then parsed on the server uh, when, you hit, when, you, when you send the request, and is resolved into function calls defined in your type schema. So if we're talking about Drupal and we send in a request uh, for uh, fetching a node, it would basically call the entity query API to load that node. And then if we go further in the graph and want to fetch a field, it will use the type data API or the entity property API to fetch that specific field and return it in that function call. So it's really important. We are actually having what we have here is function calls over HTTP. And um, um, the format that we have is uh, on the client side, we, pr we, we specify our query as a syntax that is very simple, similar to JSON without the values. And what the server essentially does is it fills in the values and provides us with the full JSON afterwards. So why is this so cool? Um, I find that the most important takeaway from GraphQL, or from the um, whole idea of GraphQL or JSON API, we actually have different, different solutions to this problem, but the most important takeaway is this. Um, GraphQL evolves the server-client-side relationship, and it changes it so that it moves a lot of the responsibility to the, to the client side. Um, with GraphQL, now the server publishes its possibilities through the type schema that, we've, that we talked about, and the client then gets a chance to specify or to tell the server specifically what it needs, and only gets that data in return. No additional data, it just gets that data in, in the exact same format that you requested it in. Um, I've been copying this slide ever since I started talking about GraphQL before because I find that is a very important takeaway from, from the whole idea of GraphQL or um, uh, query languages like this. Um, if you are interested in learning all of the details about GraphQL and the entire specification, I can't cover everything here in this presentation. Um, there's a couple of resources of different types. So the first one would be if you are uh, interested in just learn, learning by doing, then go to the first URL. It's um, the same uh, app that I so showed you before where you can execute queries against the Star Wars API. Um, um, you get type ahead, so if you press control space, you get information, or alt space, depends. Um, you get information about the available fields that you can query and of the types. And if you are um, interested in a tutorial, step-by-step -step learning, then go to the second URL. But if you are really brave, you can also read the full RFC for the parser that Facebook published um, uh, a while ago. And it's actually one of the best RFCs that I've read um, in, in, in my developer career. Um, it's quite nicely crafted, and um, but still, it's an RFC, so that's only for the brave. <laughs> um, right, so these lists of terms are very, very um, uh, important for GraphQL. Those are the most important um, features of GraphQL. Um, so we have got queries, we've got mutations, so write operations on the server. We can't cover this in this presentation, the write operation part, and it's also not supported by the module yet. Um, but it's also important to know that GraphQL does not only support read, but also write. Um, we've got fragments for allowing mixing, mi mixing in um, functionality into our queries uh, without having to rewrite the same stuff every, over and over again. Um, we've got if-else if, uh, directives. We've got arguments and variables. Um, yeah, and uh, we're going to look at some of those additional features uh, in our next demo. So let's see it in action. Um, so this was a very simple query. We just fetched data from the server through the schema. But we, didn't, we don't yet see the function call um, specifics there, or we don't see here that it's actually function call. So let's change our query slightly. Um, Let's fetch the list of films. And let's fetch the ID of the film and the title for all of the films. So what this gives us is we can now see, we can also load a specific film by providing the ID. See, it's called A New Hope. 
So that's also supported. Now we see it's actually function calls, right? So we have arguments. And we know arguments from our backend code. We, we can use, we can call functions and provide arguments. And we get a return value. And it kind of also makes clear how this whole structure works. So the, the, the schema for film um, is composed of a list of fields that make up this type. And the resolver function for the film part of the schema returns the entire film object. And the film object is then passed in to the subsequent schema fields for it, for example, title in this case. And what does the title field resolver function do? It fetches or it simply returns film arrow title, if you were talking about PHP, for example, right? So it's very, very, uh, con it's very convenient, actually. It's very, very clear, I think. Um, so if this is not enough for our query, if we, don't, if we don't want to have the JSON returned in this structure, we can also use aliasing. So this is actually called, the film is called A New Hope, and we might know that, so because we are fetching that specifically. So let's alias like this. And as you can see, the return value here, actually, do you want me to increase the size? How do you do that on the Mac? It's not mine. <laughs> Command what? Command plus. So now I have to find plus on the Mac here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't do that right now. <laughs> uh, but is it readable? Is it fine? Or do we have to change that? It's fine? Okay, good. So this is aliasing, okay? So on the left-hand side, we, we, we specify how we want the data to be returned, and the server answers in that precise way. Um, so aliasing works. And that is specifically useful when we want to fetch multiple film resources in the same query. So. Let's uh, fetch the list of films again. So let's fetch another. And you see, we can also do multiple requests with, the, with multiple root queries in the same query. So let's call this other film. And this time, we want something else. Maybe we want to have uh, the list of producers involved with the firm. And you can see that this, is, this allows us to fetch the same resource multiple times. Um, all right. So an additional feature is, because we have the type system and because we have the schema based on the type system, we can also uh, um, read the schema. So this is called introspection. The schema is published on the server. And um, at the same time you are writing the schema, or at the same time you are publishing the schema, it also, the schema also publishes itself, um, meaning that you get the chance as a, for, for, for building tooling, for building self-writing documentation, for building this graphical user interface, graphical. They are all based on schema introspection. So on the client side, you can fetch the whole type graph that is provided by your server to get an idea of what fields, of what root queries are possible. So to give you an idea how that works, um, you can basically query the schema to return all of the types, maybe the name of each type, but also all of the fields. And because they can be of a specific type again, ah, There might be another type involved here, and the same the type might have fields again. And of each of those fields, we want to have the name again. So you get an idea of how this works, right? So that's called introspection. Let's go back to the slides. Um, as I said, we can't cover all of the features in this presentation, so if you want to learn more about mutations and, well, we can probably talk about uh, directives and uh, or we can talk about fragments and variables later, but for, for, for now, this uh, is all we can do in order to fit the time slot. So, what about Drupal? So this presentation is also about Drupal. Um, and there's actually now a module for GraphQL running on Drupal 8. And, um, the goal for this module is to provide a full GraphQL schema 
out of the box and fully automatically based on the type system that we have in Drupal Core. Um, we want to expose the entire entity graph, in the future also the graph for all of the configurable of the config entities, and um, we want to automatically generate it. We don't want you to configure it yourself or you won't want you to write code for it, we want to expose it out of the box. So you create your own entity type, you create your own node type, whatever, it should be exposed automatically and it should be available for you um, um, fully through GraphQL. Um, we wanted to make it also possible for you to make listings of things uh, available without having to configure your own views. Views is also supported, but we wanted it to make it so that if you have a new entity type, you can directly query it through the Entity Query API. Um, if you have query fields, like the title field, we want you to be able to use them as function arguments on uh, the GraphQL query. And we've, also got, we've already got the ideal foundation for that in Drupal 8 core, and it's called the Type Data API. And because we have already um, a descriptive format of all of our types in Drupal 8, we can use it to iterate on, on the entire type graph um, and to generate a schema for you. So kudos to the people who worked on, on type data. Um, amazing job. So at its core, the goal would be translating the type data definitions into a GraphQL, uh, into GraphQL types and expose, exposing that as a GraphQL schema. So the initial version of that module has already been released. Uh, it's been released like a month ago. Um, it still, oh, right now it supports um, uh, some of the most crucial features for GraphQL, so fetching data um, and uh, uh, all of the type-related uh, 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 things, but it doesn't, like, it lacks some of the features. But let's first take a look at the GraphQL uh, module itself. So what we have here now is a Drupal site. It's a Drupal 8 site. And uh, as you can see, we have the graphical interface embedded into um, Drupal here. And now we can query the type graph inside of Drupal. So I've got a couple of nodes here. And now we can see that the entire schema here is for all of the entity types in Drupal is exposed. So first let's make a, a simple query on a specific node of ID 1. So let's list, the, let's get the node, fetch the node ID, which is one obviously. Let's also fetch the title, and maybe let's fetch the type. Okay, so that's the Drupal node type. And then we execute the query. Actually, one second, let's not use a type, because that goes into a config entity. Let's fetch yeah, the change date or whatever, created date. And it works. So we can now query a node, a single node, through GraphQL. Um, it also follows, so we have entity reference fields in Drupal, right? Um, and entity reference fields are also supported. So um, all of the fields that you can imagine, uh, all of the field types that you can imagine uh, in Drupal 8 are all defined as type data types. So because of that, we can also access them. And because we know that a type data, that the field of type entity reference is a data reference to some other entity, we can load that entity as well. So we can load the user, the author user, um, the user that created this, this node and uh, fetched the name. And because we don't like the UID field, we can alias that. And we can also go deeper. So there's entity types and there's some other types in Drupal which are not entity types, but they are also defined as type data uh, types. So we have the language object. And we can then go into the language object and fetch uh, the name, the human readable name of the language, and maybe the direction of the language. Is it RTL or is it LTR, right? So all of these things just work out of the box. And we talked about listing of, listings of things. So for all of these resources, for all of these entity types, we also have a query root call. So now we can fetch all of the nodes that are currently defined in the system, and for each of those, we can fetch the title. But because we have query fields exposed to the type data API, we can say, okay, only give me those of type article. 
or only those of type page. The same is true for user entity, any other entity. We can just use that same API. But how does the type system work with entities that have multiple bundles? Because we have different fields on all of those, right? Different configurable fields which, are only, ex which only exist on specific types, on specific node types. Um, so if we look at our type introspection here, we can see that we have entity node, entity node article, entity node page, somewhere down here. Um, and th they, they are all defined as separate types because GraphQL allows you to specify interfaces. So we have an interface type of entity node, which is composed of all of those um, fields that they have in common, like node ID or user ID. But we also have uh, the actual object of a specific type, in this case, entity node article or entity node page. So for example, the body field, although available on both in this case, is, is a bundle field. It's configured on a specific node. So let's make a node query again and fetch all of the node, nodes here from the system. But as you can see now, I can't fetch the body. There's nothing under B, right? I can't fetch the body directly because the type isn't aware yet that it has that field. So we have to use fragments and say, okay, if the returned object is of entity type, uh, is of type entity node article, then give me the body. And from the body, give me the full text value, not the summary. Right? So now we have articles and pages in the return data set because there's two types of nodes, right? And you can see for the type page, it didn't give me additional output, but for the type article, it did always give me the value. So we can go, even, we can do even better. We can say, okay, if this is of type entity node article, uh, page, um, I also want to, well, fetch the language. But if it's an article, I don't want that information. I don't need it in this case, right? So that also works. Um, okay. That's exciting, isn't it? No, okay, then. <laughs> so, as we said, there's still some limitations. Um, Facebook also published the React JavaScript, frame, uh, JavaScript uh, framework. It also published another JavaScript library called Relay, which allows you to consume um, GraphQL queries on the client side. And Relay is kind of like Relay has some expectations towards your GraphQL schema. Um, if you want, Relay is like a dialect on top of the GraphQL language, and your server has to speak that dialect in order to be fully supported. We don't support that yet, so we don't have Relay uh, compliancy. Um, so if you want to use React with Relay, you can't yet, sorry. Um, we don't have write operations yet. Um, that's some bonus features of GraphQL. If, if people are interested, I can show that after the presentation, of the, after the official time. Um, I have uh, an additional GraphQL server which allows mutations outside of Drupal. Uh, and we don't have config entities in there yet. So if you wanted to render the human readable name of uh, an article type, or of, a, of a node type, you can't yet because node or types are configurable entities in this case. Um, so for the future, we have planned to add relay compliance. We have got mutation support as one of the major features that we want to do, uh, also config entities, and we want to allow you to provide, um, or we want to provide a very easy uh, um, solution for you to customize your schema. So if you configure a field with a very long name because you're, uh, you have so many entity types and you have so many node types and you want to like, make a clear distinction, but in your API, you, don't, you want to hide that, um, we want to, you to be able to alias your fields on the server side. We want you to be able to like, uh, make shortcuts. So for example, if you uh, wanted to, you could like, drop in a view into one of your entity schemas um, and make the entity like the automatic um, uh, um, co contextual argument to that view. right? Um, so the official time is over. Um, I'll first go to questions, and then we can do the bonus afterwards if people are still interested. So are there any questions? And do we have to do the questions with the microphone? Does anyone know? I will just repeat them. So are there any questions? No? Everyone just interested in the bonus material or are just bored? Oh, there's one question. Hi. Right. That's a really good question. Actually, that question has been asked every time that I gave this presentation, um, so it must be true. 
um, permissions on entity and on field level are solved by the entity um, permission system and field permission system. So if you configure, um, or if you, if you have provide entity access controllers or entity access handlers for your entity types, those are called. We have an interface, a PHP interface in Drupal called accessible interface. Every time we return a value from one of the resolver function and it is of type accessible interface, we invoke the access function. And if access is granted, we return the value. If access is restricted, we eliminate the value. And you will still get a response from the server, but without the things that you don't have access to. So we don't fail the entire query, right? That's actually very important, I think. So you can like uh, shoot out the same query from the client uh, with additional information based on user permissions, and the client will just get that back what he actually has access to. Okay. Other questions? You want to see the bonus stuff? Really? Okay. Good. So um, bonus. Um, we have some some things. So we have got pagination. How pagination would work with relay compliancy? And we have how variables would work, because there's a very interesting feature that Facebook actually uses, and um, we want to support that as well in Drupal. So um, you might have the question, like, but now, because of introspection, everyone can like fetch my entire type graph and get an idea of how my Drupal site is set up, right? Um, so that might be like um, um, a big blocker for some people who don't want to expose that type graph. Um, but there's, there's a remedy for that problem. So um, Facebook does the following. In the JavaScript application, they have a build task, a build step. So while they are compiling the JavaScript code, they are statically analyzing the JavaScript code for relay or for GraphQL queries. Okay? Um, these huge strings in the JavaScript are both annoying for the front end because they increase the size of the JavaScript code, right? Because you have this long string in the code afterwards and you don't want that, maybe. So um, they are taking out these strings and uh, telling the server which um, GraphQL queries are part of the client-side application, and then the server generates routes for those. So, at the end of at the end of that whole process, the GraphQL, the generic GraphQL uh, resource is locked. You don't have access anymore to um, uh, like shoot out uh, custom GraphQL queries. Only those queries which have been part of the client-side applications, multiple maybe. Um, uh, are then executable through specific resources, okay? Uh, and that's what variables and fragments are really interesting for. So we have two things that I can demo. I can demo, uh, three things actually. I can demo write operations, I can demo um, variables for the feature that I just described, and I can demo, um, uh, what was the third thing? Oh, pagination. What do we start with? Pagination? All right, let's start with pagination. So we go back to the Star Wars API. So we want to paginate through all of the people in any of the Star Wars movies, right? And in addition to the plain people subfield, subselection that I can choose here, I have some additional things like page info. Oop. Now oh, come on. And page info has some subselections. Has next page, has previous page, starting cursor, and end cursor. What those means? What those mean? Uh, we'll check that in a second. And we've got edges. So graph theory. We've got edges. And on in each of those edges, we can fetch a the actual element part of those edge, which is the person in this case. So you can fetch the name again. And we also have is the cursor. And the cursor is like an ID containing information about um, the sorting, the position of that specific item inside of that list, um, and the type of the object. So if we execute the query, we now get all of these things. So obviously, has next page and has previous page is false. But we also get two interesting values here, so start cursor and end cursor. And if you look closely, you will see that the start cursor is the same as the first item inside of this list. And the end cursor is the same as the last item, very down here, right? Very far down there. So now if we reduce the result set to only the first two items, it gets more clear. And we see, okay, it now has a next page, 
and we get the start cursor and the end cursor um, corresponding to the two items that we have in this list. So what does this allow us to do? So now we have this element here, this, uh, this cursor, and we can say, OK. And we can actually use this one here as well. It's the same value, as you see. And we can say, OK, give me the next two after this cursor. Right? So then we have Darth Vader as the next one. And then I can use this again. So this allows you to dynamically paginate depending on your requirements in the front end again. So the server does not dictate how you paginate. The client dictates, or the client tells the server how you want to dictate and how many values you want to retrieve. So yeah, now we get the next two, etc. You can also do it in reverse. You can like say, um, give me the, the first two before this specific um, ID, and so on. So that's how pagination works. Are there any questions for that? We will have that in Drupal as well at some point. Um, um, this ID, you might wonder how that ID works. Um, it's a base 64 encoded string, basically. And that concept is part of the relay uh, idea. Um, you don't have to use base 64 encoded strings in your GraphQL implementation, but mostly you would want to do that. And it's basically a string, um, or the base 64 encoded string, containing the type of the object, the ID of the object, and then in case of pagination, the cursor, it also contains information about how it is sorted and which, which position that element has in that list. Yes? Uh, because you make a count query, basically. You make a count query at the same time. With the same properties that you are using there for loading stuff, you make also a count query. All right. If you have a what? In a graph database. Oh, you mean... In Yes, so as I said, we have view support. So you have a view here. I already configured that. It's called tests. And there's a GraphQL display, right? There's a custom display plugin for GraphQL. And the view um, just lists all of the uh, nodes on the server. And we can now use that in GraphQL as well. So there's the test blah view GraphQL display, right? And we can just use that as well. And it just gives us notes, and the notes that we saw before. OK? Oh, it's, it's filtered on articles, apparently. Yeah, it's probably filtered on articles. Let's check that. So it's working properly. Yeah, it's filtered on articles. So that's why it didn't give us any pages, right? So that works as well. Um, and in the future, it will also work so that you can, if you, if you configure a view with a contextual filter of type node, and then you fetch a node, you will have the view as a subselection of that node. So you can then further query with the view, and the node will then automatically be passed in as a um, uh, contextual argument. Okay? Uh, right, so the next feature is um, variables. Um, so let's assume you've write, you wanted to write a query and you wanted to make uh, a generic query which you can reuse later on. So you want to make the ID available as a variable and you then have to specify, okay, uh, the ID of the variable is of type ID. And then you can make a node call here uh, on, this is not entity type node, like this is the GraphQL relay node, okay? Um, no, ID is of type ID. And then we fetch, uh, oh, actually, let's make it something specific. So now we have a query which supports variables, and we can use these variables here down, down here just as JSON. So ID, um, first we have to actually, one second, we have to fetch an ID that I can copy something. So our per people. Works. 
Okay. Um, write operations, right? Do we actually have time? Oh, oh. It's 12. Uh, that's on my account. Oh god, maybe I have to know. Oh god, <laughs> one second. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. Let's see if you, it should work now. All right. So this is a GraphQL schema that I set up for a demo application. It's a to-do. It's a list of to-dos, right? And if you want to do write operations, so first let's actually list uh, all of the to-dos that have already been created. So let's fetch to-dos. Fetch the text for each of the to-do items. Those are the to-do items, just some demo things, right? And now, if you wanted to make a mutation, to add an item to this list, you can make a mutation query. And you can invoke the create to-do uh, root call. And you can give it some input, like the text. So. And this is very cool now. So in GraphQL, you can make a write operation, and as a um, successive call to that write operation, you can now fetch fields of the provided values from that write operation. So imagine you're creating a new to-do item, um, or imagine you're creating a new node, and you want to fetch the exact time stamp at the time it was created on the server. You can do that as a subsequent operation to the write, directly in the same query. So now we can make the write operation, and also get the ID, for example, of the element as, uh, with which it was written to the database. So this is the ID of the item that was created on the server for the new to-do item. So let's check if it is now inside of our list. So down here is our en entry that we have created, and let's compare it. So this is the ID that we got back by the write operation, and it's, it matches, right? So that's very, 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 very cool. And uh, yeah, I think with that, I'll conclude the presentation. Um, so thanks for your time. Uh, actually, are there any final questions before we close this? Yes? Uh, authentication works the same way with any other API calls in Drupal. You can use um, whatever Drupal authentication method is provided by any of the services in Drupal Core or Contrib modules. So that's something that you could potentially solve with GraphQL as well, but you would probably want to make it like uh, a pre, uh, like a um, pre requirement for the API. So first you want to solve authentication, and then you make the queries afterwards. So it's just a normal, like the GraphQL API route on Drupal is just a normal route, and you can use whatever authentication method that is provided by Drupal. So, Okay, so it's coffee time, and there's some additional resources. Um, I'll just leave this slide open. Um, there's like, the last one is, is from me, actually. It's just like a demo uh, um, a repository containing some React code with server-side rendering and uh, GraphQL and Relay, but it's running on the Star Wars API, not Drupal API. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for your time. <laughs>